Turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15, and we're going to be studying from this text today. You know, every once in a while there's a verse that just pops up and uh, some of the templates that I was looking at for the sermon template, and I thought this verse was a good opening verse here in Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 26. It really describes what we're about to read from King Saul in 1 Samuel 15. But Proverbs 28, 26 says, Those who trust in themselves are fools, but those who walk in wisdom are kept safe. And I think that's a very fitting description of what we're going to see here as we read some of this text and we learn from King Saul. So we're going to study this text today. Let's give a little bit of background as we think about what we've been studying so far this month. We've been focused on a study of Samuel and looking at Samuel from various perspectives from the time that he was a boy or a teen, which we studied in our first lesson from 1 Samuel 1 through 3. We've taken a look at his leadership from 1 Samuel chapter 7 and some of the roles of leadership that take place in our lesson last week. This morning we looked at 1 Samuel chapter 8 and 9 and when Samuel was rejected in a sense as a judge or his succession plan was rejected and they said give us a king so judge us like the rest of the nations and we took a look at that um, this morning. But tonight I want to think with you about how Samuel responds to the rebellious King Saul. Now, his rebellion's not an outright rebellion. Um, it's a subtle type of rebellion, but we're going to think a little bit about that here today. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 9, Samuel anointed King Saul as the first king of Israel. And Saul's kingship actually starts off, we're kind of summarizing what happens between chapter 9 and right here in chapter 15, but Saul's kingship starts off on a good note. Uh, one of the things that you'll find in chapter 10 is that Saul is counted among the prophets. And so he has the ability to prophesy, and he's among the prophets. The Spirit of God changes his heart, chapter 10 actually says, gives him a new heart, uh, which would seem to indicate God's blessing in the life of Saul as a king. We read in 1 Samuel chapter 11 that Saul's kingship starts off on a positive note because he goes to battle against Nahash and the Ammonites. And that's why the people wanted a king. They wanted a king who was going to go out, who was going to go to battle. And he seems to do that right at the start. And so he protects, in doing so, the people of Jabesh-Gilead. Uh, an interesting side note is that when Saul dies, and he dies in disgrace, but years later when he dies, the valiant men of Jabesh-Gilead are the ones who take his body and for him. So they never forgot the good things that Saul had done for them. But Saul's kingship starts to nosedive when you get to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And in this chapter, the problem is that instead of waiting for Samuel to offer a burnt offering, because Samuel was a priest, Saul was not, he may have been a prophet, he may have been a king, but it wasn't his role to, to operate as a priest. But Instead of waiting for Samuel to offer that burnt offering because Samuel wasn't there yet, Saul usurps Samuel's authority by offering the burnt offering himself before Samuel arrives. And what you read in 1 Samuel chapter 13, 11, and 12, when Saul explains and offers an excuse as to why he offered that offering, Samuel says, you have done foolishly in verse 11. 1 Samuel 13, verse 11, he says, You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Saul is already having problems as a king. Samuel is already in a role of rebuking him as a king and telling him that he is going to be rejected. And from this point forward, when you look from chapter 13, really to the end of Saul's life, Saul's good beginnings, as hopeful as they were, 
they begin to slowly spiral into a disastrous ending. So while we could have hoped that Samuel's firm rebuke here, he says, you're foolish, you're going to lose the kingdom, um, it's going to be taken away from you, God's looking for your replacement right now. While we would have hoped that that type of a rebuke would have done some good in the life of Saul, they would have shaped up. Uh, that's not actually what we see happening. We see his rebellion surface again when we get to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And from this chapter, we learn how leaders respond to subtle rebellion. Um, and we learn from Sam Samuel how he responds. And so let's look at 1 Samuel 15. We're going to look, first of all, at verses 1 through 12. And let's read. This is a long chapter, um, so we've got a lot of text to cover here. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. And now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. I'm going to stop there for just a moment because some people have a bit of a problem with this passage because of the severity of the punishment. Some people have argued that this is an evidence that the Bible supports ethnic cleansing. It had nothing to do with the ethnicity here. What it had to do with was the ethics of the people of Amalek. This is an ethical cleansing, not an ethnic cleansing. This was something that was done as a punishment for what Amalek had done um, as the text says, when the people of Israel had come up from Egypt, what had Amalek done? If you go back to other um, Old Testament passages, you will find that the Amalekites attacked Israel from the back. That means they attacked their old people. That means they attacked their impregnated people. They attacked those who were the slowest in the group. And what that was was an unethical attack. And God was holding them accountable for that at this time. And so, as we read on with the text, that's just the quick explanation as to why God was commanding this. God had his reasons for it. Verse 4 says, So Saul gathered the people together and numbered them into Laam, 200,000 foot soldiers and, and 10,000 men of Judah. Stop there. We talked about this morning. What's going to happen when they have a king? Well, there's going to be a draft. There's going to be people who are going to have to serve in the military. And we already see that by this point... There are 200,000 people as foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. He has already assembled his military. And Saul came to a city of Amalek, verse 5, and lay in wait in the valley. And then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. God had nothing against the Kenites. Um, there was no reason to attack them. And so Saul says, Go ahead and slip out. You're not a part of this judgment. Because, he says, you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. And so the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And verse 7, Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But, verse 9 but, is a key word here, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. Take a quick um, advance forward and notice the same thing gets said in verse 35 at the end of this chapter. It says, Samuel mourned for Saul and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Mentioned twice in this chapter. He goes on to say in verse 11, he greatly regrets it because Saul has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. And so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, 
And indeed, he set up a monument for himself, and he's gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. All right, we're going to stop there. I'm going to read a little bit more here in just a moment. But I want you to think about how Samuel responded to rebellious King Saul. And, and the first thing that we see, the first thing that I would point out, is that Samuel grieved, Samuel prayed, and Samuel rose early in the morning to confront him. Now, let's think about why that needed to happen and why that did happen. The orders that Samuel gave to Saul from God, they were simple and they were clear. And yet Saul disobeyed. What were those orders? Go back to verse 2. Um, he says, You're going to, I'm going to punish Amalek, verse 3. So go and attack them and utterly destroy all that they have. All. Do not. This is very clear. He even puts a little caveat at the end. Do not spare them. That means no one is to be spared from this attack. Kill. Man and woman, infinite. And he's very specific about who is to be punished in this. Ox, sheep, camel, donkey. And then you get to verse 9, and it says, Saul spared Agag. God said, do not spare. Verse 9 says, Saul spared and then it mentions some of the sheep, oxen, fatlings, lambs, and anything that was good. He spared. And so Saul did not do what Samuel clearly instructed him to do from God. Um, oftentimes, I just want to simply point this out, that oftentimes disobedience is not because God's will is unclear. God's will was very clear right here. It was, we can just read it and understand it very simply. God made no exceptions to what he had commanded here. God's word is clear. Sometimes we choose to disobey it, despite the fact that it's clear. Sometimes people like to muddy the waters and pretend that, well, we just can't really understand the Bible. And yet, what we read in Ephesians 3, for example, is Paul says that I wrote these things down so that when you read, you may understand he says later in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You can understand what God's will is. Sometimes the issue is not a matter of interpretation. It is a matter of application. You're not willing to apply what God has clearly said in His Word. And that's the issue here. It's not that God was fuzzy about it. Um, that he was cloudy with the issue, it's that Saul just didn't do what he was told to do. And so when Samuel is informed of the disobedience, he grieves, he prays all night, and he goes first thing in the morning to confront the issue. A couple of things about that then. Sin should never bring joy to the spiritually minded. It brings grief to leaders. That's why Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17, it says that we should be submissive to our elders so that they can serve with joy and not with grief, because that would be unprofitable for you. It should bring leaders, and it does bring leaders, great sadness when people who should understand and be obedient to God's will are rebellious and disobedient. It's a grief. It's a worry. It's a, it's a stress upon leaders who will be held accountable for the souls of those they lead. Now, sin brings with it complex and complicated situations, though. And this must have been, it's somewhat complex. It's somewhat complex because, first of all, Samuel here is now dealing with King Saul, not Saul of Benjamin. He's dealing with the king, and that can be somewhat intimidating because I have to be careful in how I speak to a king. This is the Lord's anointed one. I have to be careful in how I address him and how I speak to him, but I also have to be careful to realize that even though he's the king, there's a king higher than him, and that king is God, Yahweh. And so it's my job to be obedient to him. So that's complex. It's also complex because Saul doesn't seem ready to admit that he's actually disobeyed. 
That makes things complex. When people offer justifications and excuses and loopholes and, and, and defend themselves to cloudy the issue, that sometimes makes things more complex. So what do you do when you lead, when you're talking to people who are clouding the issue and making it more complicated? Well, you need to pray. I brought this up in three straight lessons. You know why? Because Samuel, one of the most fantastic examples he sets for us is that every time there's an issue that he is dealing with as a leader, he makes sure that before he deals with it, he prays. And so Samuel grieves and Samuel pre prays. Confrontation needs to be preceded by prayer. And while prayer is necessary, the example of Samuel in addressing the sin as quickly as possible is also vital. Look at verse 12. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. He's been grieving. He's been praying and crying out to the Lord all night, it says. And then first thing in the morning, he's, he's going to go ahead and he is going to talk to Saul. So the other important thing to point out is that we need to deal with rebellion and disobedience quickly, abruptly. Need to nip it in the bud before it sprouts into something much larger, before Saul can lead an entire rebellion of people, um, we need to go ahead and confront Saul before his influence becomes even more toxic. And so one of the first points that we learned from Samuel is that leaders should have tender hearts to sin. They should prayerfully seek wisdom in dealing with it and quickly seek reconciliation. Now, a second thing that we learn from Samuel, though, as we look at this text in chapter 15, is that Samuel discerns through self-willed excuses. And people who are in positions of leadership have to be discerning people. They have to be people of discretion and discernment. They have to be careful how to answer each one. People are different. Some people require a different tone of voice, um, a, a different angle. Um, some people just have to be dealt with and respond to criticism and rebuke differently. And so we have to have discernment in how we will deal with those things. And so Samuel does that. So let's read about what some of the things are that's, that, that Samuel has to deal with. Look at verse 13. Samuel went to Saul. In verse 13, Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now hold on. We just read in the text that it says to destroy completely the Amalekites and you spared Agag and the rest of the people. And yet here you are claiming, good to see you, brother. I've done everything that God commanded me. Aren't you proud of me? There's a problem with that. The disobedience here in chapter 15, it's not an outright rejection. He doesn't say, Samuel, you can take your Lord and you can go shove it. He doesn't outright reject God. No, he pretends he's doing what God wants. And that can be tricky, right? When you have people who are pretending obedience when truly they've only partially obeyed, that is a lot trickier to deal with than just an outright rejection. When people say, you know what, I'm not, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in the Bible, I don't believe in Jesus, you know, that's pretty easy to deal with. Well, you know, you're not a believer and you're making that very clear. That's very easy. But a lot of people aren't like that. A lot of people claim to believe in God, claim to believe in Jesus and the Lord, claim that they believe in the Bible, and yet they're not doing what Jesus the Lord says and what the Bible teaches. And so that becomes more complicated. Claiming to be obedient to the Lord, though, and actually obeying the Lord are two different things. And leaders have to discern between the wolves who are in sheep's clothing. And what we see is that Samuel's doing that. Verse 14. Samuel responds to Saul's claim of obedience. And he says, well, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? No. <laughs> is that a good sheep? <laughs> no. Who said, who said no? I'll throw something at you. I'm just kidding. The, the lowing of the oxen, which I hear. Moo. I'm, maybe, hopefully I'm better at oxen than sheep. No, do you hear what I hear? Right? 
Samuel is basically saying, you've obeyed the command of the Lord. Why do I hear these animals in the background, right? Why is there a barnyard behind you? Um, and so Samuel is discerning that Saul is claiming something, but it's not true. He doesn't really have to discern that very, it's not that difficult because God's already told Samuel that Saul disobeyed. Saul, um, Samuel sees the evidence when he arrives with the animals, though. So Samuel points out that if you have truly performed the commandment of the Lord, then we wouldn't be hearing sheep and oxen in the distance. And Samuel's rebuke, what it implies is that partial obedience, get this, partial obedience is disobedience. And yet how many people are guilty of this type of disobedience? It's easy to see it in King Saul. It's not always easy to see it in ourselves. We claim, well, I'm sexually faithful to my spouse. I'm drug free. Then you gossip about other people and slander them. Partial obedience. You're disobedient. You're careful with your tongue. You're a hardworking servant. You're a good provider for your family, but you're hooked on porn. Partial obedience. That's disobedience. You still haven't submitted to the Lord completely. I'm a good neighbor. I volunteer in my community. I'm a tax-paying citizen. But you're living in a marriage which defies God's will because it's an adulterous... So a homosexual marriage, partial obedience. You're claiming you've done some of what God says. That must be good enough. And you're not doing some of what God says. I contribute to the church. I teach Bible classes. I mow the church yard. I take meals to the needy. But there's some Sundays I like to take off and go to the lake and forsake communing together on the Lord's Day. Partial obedience. It's disobedience. We hear study after study. We invite our friends. We share the church's social media posts. We talk openly about Jesus. But we ignore what God says about modest apparel. We put our character into question. Partial obedience. Not doing everything that he said. We're friendly, kind to strangers, consistent worker, helpful to the neglected, good son, good daughter, but you're sleeping with your unmarried partner, which is becoming a stumbling block to other people. That is partial obedience, which is disobedience. We sing the songs, we take the communion, we pray in public, but we are awful husbands or awful parents or awful workers outside of public view, partial obedience. Truth is, I think if every person sitting out here, including myself who's standing here, if we're being honest with ourselves, then all of us have some sort of an agag in our lives that we haven't yet killed off. And this lesson is for us just as much as it ever was for Saul. Partial obedience is still disobedience, and we've got to cleanse ourselves to be holy as God is holy and sanctify ourselves. Now, leaders, what do they do? What does Samuel do? Leaders, when we're talking to other people who are in this situation, they lay out the facts which disprove the claims of obedience because people lie. And we lie to other people to justify it. And Samuel points out that that cannot be tolerated. So after Saul is caught in his lie, he then makes an excuse or justification for the disobedience, assuming that, that partial obedience will be acceptable. So notice what he says in verse 15. Saul says, when he asks, you know, Samuel had asked about the sheep and the oxen, he says, they have brought them from the Amalekites. So there's a little blame shifting going on here. Well, the, the people did it. You're the king of those people. So you approved it. But he says, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. That's his excuse. Samuel, notice how he responds. Samuel says, be quiet. 
you're going on and you're rambling and you're justifying yourself and you're coming up with excuses. Um, I, I think one of the versions just says, stop it. Stop it. He says, I'm going to tell you what the Lord said to me last night. So I want you to stop talking. I want you to listen to the Lord. And Saul, all he can say is speak on. So Samuel takes control of the conversation, tells him to stop digging himself into a hole, and be quiet and listen to the Lord. And sometimes we, we just need to be people who are willing to listen to godly people, to spiritually minded people. Samuel makes a point to Saul here in verse 17. And one of the points that he makes is that your rebellion is actually a sign of your arrogance. So look, look at verse 17. Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Little in your own eyes. When Saul begins as king, he's this humble king. He's actually hiding behind the ox cart because he's almost it's like he's afraid to be anointed as king. It, it, he doesn't think that he's qualified or fit for the job. And yet God has anointed him, and so he puts him in that position. And yet Samuel seems to think, you know what, though? The way that you view yourself has changed. Used to be humble and willing to be taught and instructed. And now you're not little in your own eyes. You think that you're a big shot now. Why would we think, by the way, that Saul thinks he's a big shot? Look at verse 12. Where was Saul when Samuel came? Well, Saul is in Carmel, and he set up a monument for, for who? For himself. Isn't that kind of a little bit of an arrogant thing to do? I mean, if I said, hey, guys, now that I'm here, you know, I'm the preacher. So can we put a statue of me out in front of the building? What would you think? This dude is off his rocker. What an arrogant little punk. Who do you think you are? You're fired. You know, like, you go somewhere else. You are getting a little too big in the head thinking like that. That's exactly what Saul's done, though. He set up a monument for himself. Hey, guys, I'm going to have a ribbon cutting party. For my own monument. And so Samuel says, you know what? You got a problem of a big ego and a big head. And you, you used to be little in your own eyes. Samuel also informed Saul that God's instructions were very clear. Notice verse 18. The Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. And so Samuel says, do you remember me telling you this? I'm repeating it to you. This was very clear. And you're not doing it. You haven't done it. And then when you read verse 19, Samuel just simply says, here's the instruction. So why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Your partial obedience was evil. It was a rejection. It was a rebellion against God. Now, Saul says in verse 20, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. He's still fighting for himself. He's still defending himself. I've still done a lot of what God said. But notice he says, I've brought back Agag, king of Amalek, but I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. And so while he's saying I've done some of what he said, he's still admitting Agag is still alive, though. He says in verse 21, The people took of the plunder sheep and oxen the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. So that's the third excuse, essentially. And after that excuse, Samuel lays down a final principle. And the principles in verses 22 and 23. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. In other words, God doesn't care about your good deeds that you think you're doing or your good reputation or your good intentions more than he does your complete submission to his will. Saul does 
what many times we do when we wanted to defend ourselves. Saul wanted to couch his rebellion in the language of devotion. He's saying, I did this sinful thing because I had a righteous reason to do so. It's like saying, yes, I was gambling and buying lotto tickets out of greed, but I'm going to give a big part of the proceeds to the church. Right? Or, yes, I'm committing homosexual acts that God condemns, but God wants me to love my neighbors. I'm couching my rebellion in the language of devotion to make it seem more acceptable. I'm not worshiping the way that Jesus or his apostles taught, but look at the big crowds we're bringing into the building by doing so. Yes, it's not right. I can't prove that it's okay, but I have a good overarching reason for it, and so I think it should be acceptable. Now, if you're a leader and you hear things like that, it takes a lot of discernment to weed through lies, excuses, half-truths, justifications, exaggerations, as we talk with people. But leaders have to patiently pull those weeds. 2 Timothy chapter 2 speaks to our role as a servant of the Lord. And this is not just something for elders. This is something for every Christian who wants to win their friends to the Lord. It says that a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility correcting those who are in opposition. We need to be able to discern those who are truly doing things that are in opposition to the Lord's will and in humility correct them. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. This is something for all servants of the Lord. We want people to come and be submissive to the Lord, but we're going to have to work through it patiently. And the same is true of those who are in the position of elders. They have to hold fast the faithful word so that they can convict those who contradict. And that's one of the roles of elders in Titus chapter 1. And so one of the things we see Samuel doing as a leader of God's people is he is discerning through self-willed excuses. He says in verse 23, rebellion, that's why I think we can call Saul a rebel because that's what Samuel calls him. Rebellion is as the sin of divination and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you from being king. And so Saul gets to the point where he says to Samuel in verse 24, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. That's a sign of bad leadership. When you're more interested in pleasing the people than you are in pleasing God. And that was Saul. Saul says, I feared the people and I obeyed their voice. Let's read down through verse 33 as we work through this text. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. By the way, I don't think this means that the Lord has condemned Saul on the spot. I think it's that the Lord has taken away his position, his divinely appointed position. There still could have been hope for Saul to have repented, but the kingship was going to be lost. God was going to replace him. Samuel turned around to go away. Samuel is finished with the conversation. And can you imagine this? Saul is deeply hurt that he is about to no longer be king. After all, he just built a monument for himself. That's kind of embarrassing to build a monument for himself and get fired the next day, you know? And so Samuel, said, uh, Samuel turns around to go away, and Saul seizes the edge of his robe, and it tore. He grabs him. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. That hurts to hear when you're an arrogant person. God's given your position to somebody better than you. 
And the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent. He is not a man that he should relent. God has made his decision, is what Samuel says. Then in verse 30, he says, I have sinned, yet honor me now, please, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Did you notice that? Do you notice that Saul doesn't say the Lord my God, but it seems as though his faith has drifted so far that he says, please come and honor me so that I can worship the Lord your God. Samuel turned back after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. And then Samuel said, bring Agag, king of the Amalekites, here to me. And so Agag came to him cautiously. Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, which would indicate the Amalekites had attacked women who were with child. As your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Now, Saul wanted Samuel to honor him by coming back with him before the elders of my people, worshiping and pretending everything was just fine. And isn't that typical of a politically correct culture? Sometimes there's pressure on us to just pretend everybody's right and nobody's wrong. And no matter what you do or what you believe, we can all be okay with God. And that's really what Saul wants to do here. He puts some pressure on Samuel. Can you just come back in front of everybody? I know that we've had this private conversation and you've told me that I've sinned and I've rebuked and I'm being rejected, but I, but I want to put on a good face for the nation. And I want everybody to think that everybody, everything is good with me, the king, and with you, the honored old judge and prophet. So can you come back with me and just worship with me and, and let's just pretend everything is good. You know, the biggest sin of our day is to tell someone that they're wrong. It's almost a part of corporate culture to play a game where we accept everybody, we condemn nobody, regardless of what they're doing. King Saul wants Samuel to come back, pretend they just have this conference, and publicly wants Samuel to be there to help raise his political clout by having Samuel present. However, notice what Samuel does. He goes back, but when Samuel returns, he makes a point of doing what Saul should have done himself. In a sense, what Samuel does is he upstages Saul. He says, I'm going to do what you want to do, and I'm going to go ahead and hack Agag into pieces. That's what he does. Samuel shows a lot of power, a lot of courage in this passage because the idea is I'm not going to put on a happy face for the nation. I'm going to let the nation know, since you blamed them as well, that you and them should have done what the Lord said. And if you're not going to do it, then as a true leader, I'm going to do it. And he takes care of it. That must have been kind of embarrassing to Saul. It tells the nation Saul didn't do what he's supposed to do, and Samuel's not happy with him. So can you imagine Samuel walking home, if indeed he did this himself, covered in blood-drenched clothes with dried blood on his hands, but with the peace of knowing that he did what he could to lead others who would not lead? And let me tell you, when you do that, and when you have to stand up to rebellion, sometimes you're going to get your hands dirty. Right, But what Samuel would not do is pretend that his fellowship with Saul was fine while Saul and the people were living in rebellion. 2 John 9 says that we cannot have fellowship. We can't even greet him who is involved in evil deeds. The idea is don't pretend that you have fellowship with people who are not living in accordance and consistent with the doctrine of Christ. So there's a lesson, I think, for us as well. The only thing that is going to fix our broken fellowship is when we all make the decision to obey our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we can have perfect fellowship and perfect unity. Well, there's one last thing that I'd point out as we finish up this text, and that is that Samuel isolates himself from toxic Saul. And again, this is, uh, we've had two texts today that are not very happy endings. 
But this is how thing in, things end with Samuel and Saul. Look at verse 34, two last verses. Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel went no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Samuel had already tried to correct Saul twice, and enough was enough. So Saul goes to his home, Samuel goes to his home, and the two people see each other no more. You know what I think is a sad comment in this passage is what you read in verse 35, where it says, Samuel mourned for Saul. The reason why that's sad is because Samuel is mourning for Saul, but it was Saul who needed to be mourning for himself. How many times have you been in that situation? I just wish that my children or my friends or my neighbors or my family or these people that I'm desperately wanting to bring to Jesus, I wish that they could see the sinfulness of their situation, and I am so hurt and brokenhearted and grieving because they won't. And so we mourn for them, but it is they, if repentance is to come, who must mourn for themselves. Samuel mourns for Saul. But Saul needs to mourn for himself. So what does Samuel do? Samuel decides, I've tried. I've talked to him multiple times, and it's time for me to quit spinning my wheels with this individual who's not serious, who is full of self-justification and excuses and defenses, and it's time for me to lead a new increase. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 16, which is what we're going to look at next Sunday morning. He's going to anoint a new king, a man after God's own heart, to be Saul's replacement. But let's just leave with this thought, and that is that sometimes... We're also in the situation of a Samuel. The New Testament speaks of the idea of separation and withdrawal because toxic people who will not repent of their sin, people who know better, can have a disastrous effect upon us and we can be guilty of wasting our time with the impenitent. Jesus teaches over and over again, for example, when he says to the limited commission, you go from house to house. If they receive you, walk in there, take a drink, study with them. Let them know that peace can come upon this house. But if they will not receive you, wipe the dust off your feet and just go to the next house. Don't waste your time anymore. It says in Matthew 18, if there's someone who is a brother who is in sin, you go, you talk to them. If it doesn't work, try again bringing a couple people with you. If that doesn't work, then maybe you need to get the whole church involved to bring them to repentance. But if that doesn't work, then you go ahead and treat them like a heathen and a tax collector. And the idea is you just walk the other way, and sometimes you have to break free and move on. Romans 16, 17 says that people who... Um, are not following true doctrine. We may have to separate ourselves. 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks to people in Corinth who are committing things like fornication and idolatry and who are revilers. And he says there, there comes a point where if these are brothers in Christ and they won't change, where you need to not company with them. So there sometimes is a breaking point, whether it be moral sins or, or even doctrinal sins like in Titus 3, where we've given a couple of warnings, nothing has changed, where we just need to break free. Samuel does that with Saul. He moves on to David and tutoring and mentoring him, and he moves away from Saul, whom he's ever already trying to work with. At some point in time, we're all going to be in Samuel's shoes, right? We're going to deal with rebellious people, especially in this culture. If you haven't noticed, there's an, there's an air of, of rebellion in the culture that we live in today. And so we will deal with, with our canes who pretended to have nothing wrong while his brother's blood soaked in the soil. We're going to have to deal with our Korahs like Moses who, who dealt with someone who was trying to start a revolt within the camp. Joshua had to deal with Achan who tried to hide his sin from the rest of Israel when he had stolen the spoils from Jericho. 
Samuel had to deal with King Saul. King David had to confront his own son's devious flattery when Absalom tried to destroy the kingdom. Jesus had to confront Judas. The early apostles were quickly tested by the false claims of Ananias and Sapphira. Fakers and imitators who pretend righteousness while living in disobedience will be a part of our lives at some point. And so we've got to take a page out of the Samuel handbook when those situations arise and we grieve and we pray and we rise early to deal head first with the situation, being careful not to let the false claims of disobedience, of obedience, deceive us when the facts say otherwise. Many warnings in Scripture exist telling us to not be deceived. And so when sin exists, let's not allow people to cause us to see evil as good and to mistake darkness for light. To tolerate that type of a sin is only to compromise with a self-righteous rebellion. It is to tell a king, Saul, that's okay. You're okay. Keep doing that. To be guilty of claiming to be in a right relationship with the Lord while you knowingly are leaving His will undone is to step out of a good relationship with God, put your soul at risk, and those who would follow your example. And so leaders have to set the standard, like Samuel, in dealing with these types of problems. What about you? What about you? I get a sermon that I preach. Uh, I've preached at a lot of places. It's all in First Samuel 15. Completely different sermon than this one, but the title of it is "What's Your Agag?" What is it that God has called you to do that you're still holding on to, justifying and defending that you need to get rid of in your life? What is it you need to correct?